to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast brought to you by Kraken. I'm your host Peter McCormack and today I've got a double interview with Amin Salamani and Ali Eve Knox from Spankchain looking at the issues faced by sex workers and how cryptocurrencies can help. But before that I've got a message from my show sponsors and I just want to say a big thank you to all of them for supporting this show. There are many important issues covered here so if you usually skip the intro then please do check out my intro comments after the ads because there's a few points I wanted to make before you actually listen to the interview. Anyway, on to my amazing sponsors. So first up, Kraken. They made a big announcement this week regarding security. And this is one of the reasons I love Kraken so much, the way they approach so many different things. For me, they are without doubt the cryptocurrency market leader in security. They've made it their number one priority above anything else that they want to protect their clients. Their chief security officer at Kraken, Nick Pococo, has written an open letter which is available on the Kraken blog where they point out a few things they're working on. So firstly, they've enhanced their two-factor authentication by enforcing it on login, making security core to all Kraken user accounts and also a very cool thing they've done is they have launched Kraken Security Labs which is their commitment to improving the security of the entire cryptocurrency ecosystem by performing vulnerability research against third-party products such as hardware wallets, software wallets and other related technology and they're going to disclose identified issues in a way that does not jeopardize the security of the industry but improve the security for everyone. I've taken this straight from their blog I think this is super cool I love the way they do these things it's such a Kraken thing to do to be looking at the the whole industry not just themselves and we know security is so important with all the hacks that have happened so this is great nick himself has a two decade history as an active member of the security industry i'm going to definitely get him on at some point onto the podcast because i think it'll be really interesting to do a deep dive into security across cryptocurrencies so yeah keep an eye out for that if you want to join me in supporting kraken the best crypto exchange in the world head over to kraken.com which is k-r-a-k-e-n.com also let's talk about blockfi And I've run some ads for the last two weeks with regards to their interest accounts because there's been a lot of questions about it, a lot of debate, some people aren't happy with it. And Zach, their CEO, and I have a very good and open relationship. We talk regularly. You know, Zach's aware that people have been questioning me about the sponsorship. So he said to me, come on, Pete, let's just open up the floor. If people have got questions, they can send them to you. We'll do an open session. I can ask him all those questions. He'll answer and we'll record that and put that up on SoundCloud for people to listen to. I've already had... I think about eight emails with various questions coming in. So that's super cool. We are listening. If you do have questions for Zach, please fire them over to me on my email, which is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And I'll be recording that with Zach next week and putting it up for you to all listen to. That's hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Yeah, fire over your questions and I'll get them to Zach. So on to the two interviews I recorded with Amin and Ali. And they've already received a bunch of criticism before being released. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, people think I'm becoming a shit coiner. And also they think Spankchain is a scam. So let me just give a bit of a background. I was in Venice having a few days off when I had been traveling around the world doing various interviews. And I got up one morning and I read an article on Decrypt about a journalist who had visited Spankchain and was discussing the various issues faced by sex workers. And as it said in the article that Spankchain was in Venice, I reached out to Amin and said, look, these are important subjects. I'd love to come and talk to you about them. And within an hour, we were recording because he was about to leave town. So listen, let me just say, firstly, I am not promoting Spank Chain here. I'm not validating the business. I'm not legitimizing them. I don't know enough about it. I didn't have enough time before to research it. But I certainly was aware that Amin had a deep knowledge of the industry of how sex workers have been deplatformed by the likes of PayPal and Coinbase. They can't get bank accounts, etc. And it is a perfect kind of fit with crypto. And so I just wanted to talk to Amin about this, find out what's happening, how Spank Chain are approaching this. Now, I know a lot of people will just say, well, why don't they just use Bitcoin and Spank Chain as a scam ICO, etc.? But even Bitcoin has issues for sex workers, one of the main ones being volatility. An issue also faced if using Ethereum. Anyway, listen, there are so many issues with the industry, such as fees being taken by cam sites, being at like 50%, chargebacks, etc. And these were things I knew I just wanted to get into and wanted to find out more about. And following the interview with Amin, I then traveled to Austin and met up with Ali, who herself is an adult sex worker, but also works for Spank Chain. I wanted to find out directly from her the issues that sex workers face, and not just with being paid, also actually the issues they actually face being in the industry. It's a topic I don't know enough about, so I wanted to cover that as well. So listen, I can't validate the spank chain tech. I've read different things from them being scammers to working on some of the most interesting and advanced Ethereum solutions. To be honest, this isn't the point of the interview. I just wanted to learn more about the underbelly of the industry and share this out with my audience, as I know there's probably a high chance that some of you consume porn, whether or not you want to admit it, and there are issues faced by sex workers I think we should be aware of. So listen, as ever, 
Feedback is always welcome. In terms of ordering, first up, you're going to hear from Ali, as I wanted to focus on the issues faced by sex workers first. And then you'll hear from Amin, as I wanted to ask him similar questions, but also ask him how he's trying to solve this. Anyway, listen, I hope you enjoy it. Feedback welcome, as I said. And just a couple of other things. Lightning Month starts next week. Looking forward to getting some of these interviews out. I've got some great ones coming up. And also, if you join the podcast, you want to support what I do, head over to my website, which is whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. And yeah, hope you enjoy the interview. Any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Ali, hello. How are you? Doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Had a nice feed. Thank you for bringing me out here to Salt Lick. Is this yeah. a, a famous place? It's so great. It's like one of the best barbecue places in the world. I told you last time I was here in Austin, I was a vegan <laughs> and I was getting taken to all these barbecue places and having jalapenos and a bit of bread so uh, bit of a, a change this time bit of a change <laughs> so listen thank you for agreeing to see me and Absolutely. um i obviously met with amin out in venice uh-huh. and i'm not a huge ethereum person but i'm very interested in how bitcoin and crypto can help sex workers people who have been censored and blocked by various payment channels yep so before we start talking about the industry and Can you just tell me what Bitcoin means for you and what it's enabled you to do? Sure. Um, I started taking Bitcoin in 2014 for Skypes. Um, It was a different payment source because I had had all my payment apps shut down. So I had had my Cash App, my Google Pay, my PayPal, everything you could name. I had it shut down because I violated the terms of service. Um, by <laughs> using it for sex work. It's, it's kind of funny because the thing that I got shut down from PayPal is somebody was just giving me a tribute, which was, you know, they were paying their, their money to me or whatever and got it shut down that way. So it wasn't like I was escorting or doing anything that was against the law, but PayPal didn't like it, kept my money, shut my account, whatever. So I was looking for another way to take some cash. So I had heard about Bitcoin earlier, probably in 2013 or so. I had had an argument with um, a guy I was seeing at the time, and he said, we have to get into Bitcoin. Like, we have to do this. And I was like, okay, we should get it, and we should, you know, sell some drugs or some sex or something that people want, you know, this this uh, alternative payment for all these things that, you know, can't use it for. And he was like, no, we have to go mainstream. Well, turns out we're both right. Okay. <laughs> so I started taking it in 2014. Um, for payment for Skypes, held a bunch, sold it in 2017 at the in December, and um, bought a house. Good timing. Yeah, it was really great. I, I'm kind of kicking myself because I sold it like 19 grand instead of 21, but you know. Oh, come on. You've beaten everyone It's one there, of those, though. It's one of those things where I like, I could have had it. Well, I think I sold some all the way down at about... 8,000. Yeah. So I think you've done all right there. That's not I've good. done all right. I, I, in Ethereum this last year, I've lost like 60% of my paycheck, which is a real fucking bummer, but I know. Well, I know. look, the thing is, is that the really interesting thing there is that Bitcoin has enabled you to work, right? You're not doing Absolutely. Any, Bitcoin work, changed my life for sure. But you're working in an industry that's considered legal. I am. And you are working in an industry whereby you won't be arrested for what you're doing, yet you are censored by the payment processes. Yep. Are you censored by the banks? Absolutely. I've had my bank account shut down, my P.O. box shut down, my Amazon wish list. Right. Yeah, you name it. And Again, be- all legal work. All legal work. But at the same time, we should probably also recognize that there are going to be... I'm going to... I'm going to put this to gender there are going to be women out there working in prostitution absolutely who whatever moral judgment we make i have no problem with somebody earning money how they want but they are also whilst it may be deemed illegal there's certain conversations about decriminalization people still need to be able to earn a living so absolutely everyone yeah and i'm not passing judgment on them whatsoever i'm just making it clear that i do legal work so it's even more <laughs> of a problem when i get my thing shut down because it's like well I'm, I'm just doing things that some people don't like it's not like i'm doing anything that's harming anyone or anything like that is this an industry-wide problem or is this a problem for sex workers but maybe not for the maybe largest sex companies or is it industry? Oh no, work? they get screwed too. Okay. Oh yeah. I mean, they're. <laughs> I had a. I shot a scene once, and I got my check, and I went to put it in the bank, and by the time they had written the check to the time I put it in the bank, which was I don't know three hours or so, they'd had their account shut down. So I had to go back and get another check from whenever they were able to open their new bank account, and they were just a regular porn company. But banks don't like it. Right. Yeah. And you have a belief that the people 
who are making the decisions to close this down are then going home and consuming pornography. Yes, I do. Um, actually, one of the people that I got a lot of Bitcoins was from a financial advisor. Um, and he was strictly working for a company that shut down one of my accounts. But he would come and do his dirty work with me and pay me on the side. Yeah. Are there any debates around this? Is anybody discussing this? Is there Are there any financial institutions who are appearing a little bit more open-minded or liberal? Yeah, I think so. I mean, somebody recently was talking about making their own coin. Uh, Facebook's what pull it in some their own coin right now too. So I think it's gonna, and which is great in my opinion, which is great because it's gonna have this mainstream adoption, and it's and that's what we all want, right? All right. We all want everybody to use it. Uh, is it gonna work? I don't know. Is it gonna take some time? Probably. Is the government eventually gonna get their hands in it? Probably. Um, until then, I'm just gonna keep on rolling and keep on accepting it. <laughs> All right, and also, how widespread is the understanding and knowledge of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in the industry? Do a lot of people you're speaking to understand it, or is it still relatively new? Super new. Okay. People are still like, you know, this is scammy, this is strange. Um, the price volatility is a fucking problem, um, especially when... Uh, on our side, it's a little bit different because we have a stable coin yep. now. So, you know, you're paid out the same amount. But prior to this, we didn't. So some models would be paid. And by the time they'd get off of their shift, it had already been a different price, which was very problem- problematic for people who were just getting into this and trusting us. And they were like, oh, this is weird. I went to check my account. It's a completely different number. Well, like, this is how fucking this is how this works. Right. You know okay. what I mean? So, yeah, it's it's still new. It's it's a problem for us to find people that are willing to part with their crypto currently. Which is a big deal for when I'm showing my, my tits and you don't want to part with your crypto. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. What kind of education job needs doing for the industry? And are there aha moments for some sex workers where you've shown them something and they're like, oh, okay, this makes sense? Yeah, for sure. Um, we have like a, a <laughs> I don't know if Amin told you about our onboarding tool, which is Crypto Titties. I'm aware of it. Yeah. So that was a really good onboarding. It brought a lot of people in. It got us a lot of attention. It's kind of fun. You literally put your picture of your tits up and people go and tip you. Um, We have every single gender on there. We don't discriminate for anything. Anybody wants to uh, apply to our site, they have to, um, you know, put their ID in and everything like that because they have to verify that they're of age. So we are, you know, we have to verify your identity to to still be in the legal ramifications and everything like that. So... You know, you can't be completely anonymous, but that's just, that's how any campsite, anything that you're going to be potentially, I mean, I, I probably even Twitch is that way. I don't know. Anything that where you could potentially show any type of sexual content, you're going to have to identify. So that's a problem, okay. but it's also, you know, keeps us safe and keeps others safe. And it's how we run a, a really good platform. Anyway, so you can, once you are approved through that and you give us your identification, you can go up on crypto titties and the people can start tipping you. Well, when you start getting tips and you start getting that money, well, people want to learn about it. They want to learn how to flip it or how to cash it out. I mean, once you're given that money, you're going to learn stuff. So that's kind of the, the tool that we've taken. Um, there's probably some other stuff out there. I know there's um, some cam people that get on and they'll talk about crypto and stuff like that, but it's still so new. Right. Have you experienced any problems offboarding from Bitcoin into dollars? I had my Coinbase shut down, if that's what you mean. Okay. Yeah. For the same reasons? Um, I did a show on Showtime called Darknet where I talked about using Bitcoin for sex work. And um, I was showing my QR code to the camera so people can send me <laughs> money through the camera because, you, you know, you can just uh-huh. scan it like that. And Coinbase didn't like it. I had violated the terms. So they shut my ass down and then blocked me. So that was problematic. I just shifted around to a new um, place. And <laughs> I now use a place that doesn't have sex work in their terms. Okay. Um, it's my problem. I violate terms. Right. Okay. I shouldn't be using it for what I am. But again, I'm legal, all those things. It's How do they differentiate between that and I'm not human trafficking or I'm not using it for escorting? They don't. So I don't get upset when those kinds of things happen. It's a fucking bummer because it's my money or whatever. But... I get it. So we're dealing with corporate moral judgment. For sure. Okay. Absolutely. But there's also there's also some the reasoning behind this. I mean, there is some human trafficking that goes on. There is escorting that goes on. There are things that are illegal that happen and that can't happen in those kinds of transactions. Like, I get it. But I imagine the more you sense this, the more you push it on the ground, the harder you make it for people, that probably increases the risk. For example, I I support the legalization of prostitution because my belief is a... Decriminalization. Sorry. um, 
I don't think I have a problem with legalization because I think a regulated industry would probably be a safe industry for people to work in. Does that make sense? I see what you're saying. I don't necessarily agree because okay. I don't know that I want the government to regulate my <laughs> well, business, okay. but they, that's what they're doing anyway. Right. Um, we, as sex workers, say decriminalization. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a bit safer for us. I can't really speak to this completely because I'm not super knowledgeable in this. There's a lot of people that are way more knowledgeable than this. But anyway, continue. <laughs> well, no, but it's useful for me to hear that. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to meet you because I want to learn about this industry. You know, when I met Amin, he said 70% of people consume pornography. You think it's higher? I, I suspect it is higher. Yeah. Um, it's taboo. People don't want to talk about it unless they're with maybe mm -hmm. one or two buddies. And as such, it seems to have a gray cloud over it when it's probably one of the largest industries in the world and so there's things i want to learn about it so what would help me is can you just give me a background as to how you first came into the into the industry and the various roles and things you've done yeah totally um started in 2014 i graduated from grad school i was like a hundred grand in debt from <laughs> going to college for eight years and collecting degrees so i was working in a job that i went to grad school for and was making hardly any money. I had gone through a divorce. I had taken a huge hit in my divorce. I support my brother. Um, I have a lot of, I have a, an expensive lifestyle <laughs> that I've become accustomed to and I, my job wasn't cutting it. So I'm um, in probably, we'll say a decade ago, I had posed for Playboy and I had worked them for them with years and they treated me like a queen. Okay. Um, Playboy is and was the ultimate. They are very structured. They're very, they, they have every single thing together. Every single thing is buttoned up. They're wonderful. They're great to their girls. Um, love them. Anyway. So you met I, Hugh? I have a couple times. Yeah. So loved Playboy. And I knew that from posing and being around this type of interaction with men, um, I could make a living off of it. So I started camming on Playboy. They had a site at the time. I started camming and my first night I made like 600 bucks or something. And I remember I just showed my tits and I didn't even talk at the time. I just like typed. One evening. One evening. It was okay. after I got off work. And it was so great because like at the time I was sitting in traffic all the time. You know, all the, all, I, I worked for these people who didn't even really like me. I worked a lot. Um, and it, it just wasn't making any money. It just, life just fucking sucked. Okay. And this is what I had gone to grad school for. So like, what is happening? I just spent eight years of my life and a lot of money to not, to have this shitty lifestyle. So anyway, I started camming and made a lot of money and was like, oh shit, this is great. So in the fall, maybe winter that year, I decided I'm going to shoot some porn. I need it for marketing. I can get my name out there and maybe this will be kind of fun. Okay, but I don't imagine it was a rash decision. You had oh, to Oh no. Through yeah. It. I'm I'm a thinker first of all and I you know do my pros and cons list and I knew that once it was out there it was going to be out there forever. I uh -huh. knew all the stigmas that came with it. I knew all the shitty things. I knew all the wonderful things. I had gone and researched a bunch of stuff. I'd read blogs. I had gone into um there's this site that like tells cam girls and cam models like how to how to cam how to do this and it was lots of tips from people that have been in the business forever so i researched the shit out of it did um, you discuss it with your family at all no okay yeah no i didn't so and they had known that i had done playboy and stuff like that and th at the time they knew i was camming okay um my family's all very cool so it was okay. never a, really a problem so then i started shooting porn i shot porn i shot boy girl porn for probably like eight months or so and then i had an injury so I decided, you know, this isn't really for me. I don't really want to do this. I was flying back and forth from Texas, and I was still camming on the side. And I had gone through a round of porn, and I sat down with somebody that was in the industry forever. And he said, listen, you have to... He gave me a whole bunch of advice, and he said, you have to own your own content. You have to do all of the things. You have to cam. You have to make clips. You have to get on the, the phone sex. Like, you have to do every single thing if you want to have some longevity. So I did. Okay, so a bit like I've got to be on iTunes, Apple, SoundCloud, yeah. YouTube. I've got to have a website. I've got to be on Twitter. Uh -huh. I've got to market in social. Yeah. Pretty similar. You got to hustle. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the days of Jenna Jameson, she was pulling in so much money from porn, but like those days are done. She was also crossover into, didn't she make, she actually made films as well, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, um, that's, but that was a different time. You know, they can make 30 grand on a, on a film. Right. Okay. Shit, you make your rate now. Well, what's your rate? You're lucky if you hit your rate. I mean, my rate when I was shooting Boy Girl was 1600 bucks. I don't know anybody that makes 1600 bucks For shooting. one scene? Yeah. 
Okay. And how long on average is a scene? Or how long are you? Are You're probably you there for? for like five hours because you got to do hair and makeup. Then you got to go through all the consent paperwork, all that stuff. And then you shoot. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me go back a step. So sure. you're preparing for your first adult scene. Okay. Are there any licenses you have to get? Any any regulatory processes you have to go through? You have to test. So you okay. have to make sure that you do not have any SDIs or anything like that. Okay. Um, you have no HIV. So it's a blood test and a urine test. Um, and then I had an agent at the time. And that's kind of why I stopped shooting also is like I didn't have – um, the agent allowed me to be in some unsafe positions. Okay. And so I didn't want to shoot with him anymore. So I actually stopped shooting for a period of time so I could get out of my contract. When you're preparing for your first yeah. uh, scene and you're going into the industry, are there any uh, support networks for people to introduce them, to prepare them for what's going to happen or prepare them for maybe any emotional difficulty they go through sure. with it? Um, at the time, I did not know any of any. I don't know if there are some that exist. There are now. Um, there's, um, and they're run mostly on donation. I don't even know like how they get their funding other than corporations that give money to them. There's uh, one that does mental health. There's um, a group of ladies in Portland and in Vegas that are called the Cupcake Girls, and they are offer a bunch of different services for free for sex workers. I mean, financial stuff, legal stuff, health stuff, tons of info. Um, I didn't know about them at the time. I know about them now from being in the industry and, and um, doing some fundraisers for them and that stuff like that. But at the time, I had only known what the internet had told me <laughs> and stuff. I had research, which is probably 500 times more than most people that got into the industry. Yeah. I guess one of the things that I would worry about, and I talked to you about this beforehand, is I guess... The legal age of consent for this is 18. Yeah. And I would worry that there maybe are some young girls who, out of whatever reason in they have, can maybe be introduced to some intimidating or quite aggressive requirements early on and maybe don't have the, I don't know, maybe don't have the confidence to protect themselves. Yes. Is this a common problem? Absolutely. Um, I can't imagine, and I'm pretty with it, I... You know, I don't do drugs and I show up on time and I'm pretty financially stable and smart about it. Um, but I can't imagine being 18 and not because when I was 18, I wasn't and I'm pretty with it. I can't imagine needing sex work when you're 18. I mean, I came into it a lot older, too. I was in my late 20s. And so I had a lot of life experience. I had a lot of sense. Um, I had a plan. But I can't imagine not. It's it's certainly a, an industry where you can be eaten up and spit out very, very easily. Also, replaced. I mean, I remember my agent told me once, and this sticks with me. This is like one of the quotes that it's just, it, it's one of those like eye-opening moments. And it was, every single girl, every single day, another girl turns 18. Wow. Yeah. So is there... And a, that was like, that was like, he was proud of that because he was going to get the girl when she turned 18. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was just like this cycle, but that's a real thing because if you don't perform the thing and you don't meet the rate and you don't show up on time or if you're shitty to work with, someone's going to replace you and then that's it. And I guess w one thing I find quite strange there is that you, at the age of 18, you can legally be a sex worker in the adult industry mm -hmm. and you can make hardcore pornography but you are not old enough to go into a bar and drink a whiskey. Yep. And I find that kind of confusing. Yep, kind of confusing, for uh, sure. If anything, it should be the other way around, or it should be some maybe parity. <sighs> I, I don't know. I mean, maybe there are some 18-year-olds that are, like, prepared for this, but, like, in my late 20s, I wasn't. I know when I got into it, after all the research and all the e talking to people, every single thing I had done, I got into it and was like, what the fuck? Like, this is nuts. I didn't know about this and this and that and this. and. So, so what are the things that you didn't know about that I or anyone else listening wouldn't know about or be aware of? What are some of the things that, you know, that go on that we just, we don't know about? Okay. I mean, it's, it sounds like no big deal, but it's stuff like, so I didn't live there, so I would fly there and I would book up a bunch of scenes. Well, I didn't know that some scenes would get canceled or some scenes you'd get replaced or some scenes didn't even really exist because your agent fucking sucks. And they just wanted to get you out there just to shoot because they may get you out there one time. So they're going to try to shoot you up and get as much money as they from, from you as you possibly can because you may go home hating this and you never come back. And that happens a lot. So I get there. Um, I stay in a model house, which you pay for, which is no big deal because you'd pay for a hotel or anything like that. But like the model house I was in was fucking cray. Like 
the girl that ran it was just a drug addict, absolutely nuts. She was constantly doing unsafe stuff with the girls were there. And here I am, (laughs) you know, away from home in a different state alone. Some of the scenes I had shot, you know, they don't pay for two weeks. You have to go to set. You have to pay for all your, you know, all your lingerie and all the, all your shoes, all your, all your shit like that. You have to test. So you're out of of pocket that money before you can even get paid. Well, you maybe got getting paid for two weeks. Well, that's a fucking problem when you're 18 years old and you know, you've just, you got one paycheck and you fucking blew it on clothes or whatever for your next scene. Like, so there's a lot of opportunity for people to be exploited for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is there anything that can be done about that? Do you have thoughts on this? Probably. Um, in my opinion, I think there needs to be, and maybe this is a thing that is happened or is happening or will happen, but it would have been nice for me to have conversations with people in the business about the business before I got into the business. I had read stuff online or anything like that, but some sort of like mentorship or some sort of like how to do this. That would have been incredibly helpful. It may exist. I don't know about it. I think another thing is sometimes agents or production companies or directors, like they're just, some of them are shitty. Some of them don't care about the well-being. They only want the money. And there's some things that shouldn't happen that happen. It's rare, but it does. And people don't speak out against it because they need their paycheck. So like I shot a scene once and I was in fucking pain. I got injured and it was actually the last boy girl scene that I ever shot. Um, I got injured and I remember the director kept saying, we have to have two minutes without a cut. So you have to keep filming. And I was like, listen, like homie, I can't like, I'm bleeding. Like this is a fucking problem. I can't do this. And he was just like, no, or you're not getting paid until you finish the scene. Right. And that's a problem. That's a problem. It's super unsafe. And those kinds of things happen all the time. Well, I've never talked about it. I've never said the company. I've never said the director. Like, I don't say those kinds of things because I want to get booked. Well, that even creates more problems. So what? what is a solution is maybe coming forward and saying things and, and people being taken seriously. But, I don't know. But the industry does have some quite tough regulations. Are they self-imposed regulations or are they enforced by the law? For example, there's the two-week testing program. Is that mm-hmm. legal or is that an industry-wide? I'm certain that's industry-wide. Okay. So yeah. does the industry have its own set of guidelines or rules? And does it have its own organization that oversees it? They have some volunteer organizations, and they're essentially like kind of unions or things that speak out. There's um, the Free Speech Coalition, which speaks out for on behalf of performers, and they do a lot of the legal le- uh, litigation and stuff like that. Those people are there... Um, They can't protect you. They can offer some help. If you need things, they can offer resources and stuff like that. Um, But they're not making rules that people are following. They have like a consent checklist, which they got together, where people can fill out the consent checklist. So if any of your boundaries are crossed, then what? I don't know. I don't know what happens then. I guess it's what I'm thinking about here is if somebody's become injured and they are being pressured or forced into doing something, continuing they, they don't want. I'm struggling to understand the difference between that and abuse. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh-huh. Can you talk about that? Or do you have a view on that? No, that stuff is abuse. Okay. I mean, there's nobody regulating it other than the few people that come out and will say something. I mean, you mentioned the performer earlier, and I told you that, he, you know, some performers had come out. Homeboy's still shooting. Yeah, I mentioned to you that I watched a documentary where a clinic is being run by an ex-porn star and she runs the clinic for sexual health and she's regularly, she said very regularly, dealing with people coming in with uh, injuries. And what that's made me think about is that there are real consequences behind the scenes of uh, this industry and that people aren't aware of maybe this or... so. Are there things that people who consume pornography should be aware of and should care about? Because I think in any other industry... So, for example, I'll give you a couple examples. It's a legal industry, right? So, there have been scandals related to, say, uh, gymnasts for Olympics where they've been pressured and abused and dealt with in a very terrible way in trying to get the best out of them to be a performer. That, as a society, we look on that and we go, that is absolutely terrible. 
We have the same people who may watch gymnasts at the Olympics, who also watch pornography, who don't seem to care about the people who are maybe working on camera. So, I, I know you're going to say yes, but people should care, right? Yeah, for sure. It's one of those things where if someone was to get injured on the job or, you know, to be taken advantage of or abused or whatever, a lot of people are going to say, well, she was just a whore. She, what did she expect getting into the porn industry? That shouldn't be the case. <laughs> and and I blame it on lots of things like, um, and I'll probably never work for their company again, and I usually don't because fuck those assholes. But um, MindGeek, in my opinion, completely ruined everything. They put all the porn up. <laughs> they allow people to steal all the porn and put it up. And now people aren't paying. So now, um, girl, I'll say primarily girls, but men too, they're um, shooting scenes for less because the production companies have less. So now they're having to do things that they wouldn't necessarily do because they got the fucking rent to pay. Um, that's super problematic. So one thing that we as consumers can do is not pay, you know, don't go to fucking Pornhub. Like, know that that stuff is stolen. Know that that stuff's not supposed so to be stolen. there. There's mo the majority of it. Some okay. some companies have resorted to, like, they'll put a smaller cut-down scene on there and to drive traffic. Uh -huh. Well, like I fucking trailer. refuse, like a trailer. I fucking refuse because I, first of all, I don't want consumers. I don't want this clientele that's going to go and get free porn. I want people that are going to pay me money. Hello. But a trailer's unfair, really, because... I guess the way people consume pornography, you can survive on trailers. Absolutely. You don't and need to see the obviously. Movie. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, if you're putting 12 minutes up of a 30 minute scene, well, 12 minutes, what's an, what's an hour wank? Like five minutes? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, so, what, what's quite interesting there is when I release my podcast at the start, I always say to people, please listen to the adverts because it's the adverts that pay yeah. for me to do yeah. this. And I also, when people will go on YouTube and they'll put the timestamp of where the ads finish. And I always comment and say, no, don't do this because yeah. without the advertisers, I can't do uh -huh. this. So you can't have free content. Therefore, I don't see any difference between this situation and that because I, it's creating undue pressure on the... For sure. So porn doesn't have a lot of advertisements. Nope. You know, they'll have those dick pills or whatever like that. But like there's so many companies that won't put their hands on this. Mm -hmm. And so that's another problem is now companies have to make money where they can. So a product that we know is consumed by over 70% of people is struggling because society hasn't accepted it. Yeah, it's still too taboo. Yeah, for sure. So we need to open And I can easily go to Pornhub right now and watch, and, and that's fine. You know, they don't have to come by my videos. They don't have to support me in any way. They can just go and, you know, buy a rip. So a mind geek hated by the industry, or are they seen as a necessary evil? Both, right. unfortunately. I mean, they came through and they bought up a bunch of studios. They, um, the one company that I actually do shoot for, for them, they treat me very fucking well. Okay. Um, that's the unfortunate <laughs> part of this business. So explain to me the best companies you work with. What do they do differently? How, how do they treat their performers better? Um, the best companies that I work with treat us, they consider us artists. Okay. Um, so first of all, even just having that difference, uh, rather than a performer, an artist, someone that's coming in creating content. Cause, so I'm not just performing. I also create stuff. I also edit stuff. There's a lot that goes behind this process. So even considering you know, us as um, it steps up our professionalism, which is a huge thing. And then we're, you know, sometimes even taken more seriously. People like you get us on podcasts and we're doing mainstream stuff. We're talking about how to fix this, how we can, you know, br bridge the gap between a different industries. Um, those kinds of things are super important. Is there a problem with drugs in the industry? I think there's a problem with drugs in any industry. Agreed. Yeah. My, I think the difference here is I would worry that people who have a drug problem have a very quick way to quick money if they're willing to lower their standards or do things they wouldn't want to do. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if I would say was addicted to drugs, I can't suddenly go out and do some low value podcasts and make some money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, is this monitored tool at all? Are there any support networks for uh, sex workers who are addicted to drugs? Probably, like I was saying with those uh, charities, there's probably some resources that they have. I don't know about any of them, but I also never needed anything and had to look into anything. So I, it's not widely known, I'll say that. All right, okay. So what I'm really taking from this interview is that there's a couple of main issues. Firstly, that, I mean, 
I don't want to say regulated, but it feels like regulations would be very helpful for the industry to have a set of standards to work by and knowing that if uh, those standards are, and a line is crossed, that people could be up for criminal charge because most industry, there are a lot of industries whereby if you could be injured and you're at fault for that, you can be held criminally liable. And it feels like the industry needs this. Some sort of regulation. I don't necessarily know if it's government or if it's industry wide. I think that there's a lot of people that have, you know, consent checklist or a code of conduct that you have to follow. And when people don't, that needs to be known. People need to know that. Um, somebody shouldn't have 12 people have to come forward before we know that this person sucks to work with. You know? It doesn't need to be it based need on to be. Unknown, well, unsaid reputations or yeah. undiscussed reputations. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. And then, the, obviously, the second issue, because we've discussed it, is uh, financial censorship, which is a real problem. Yeah. And so, what do you think can be done there? What, how could people help the industry? What do people need to be aware of? Help the industry would be uh, pay for your content. If you are into a performer or a model or, you know, a content maker, buy their stuff. Support them because they have bills to pay. And if you don't, we're not going to make it. I mean, that's that's the way for me to go away is to stop fucking paying me. You know what I mean? Well, to go away in terms of But I'm offering a service that people yeah. want. Yeah. So... I'm very lucky that I work in the fetish world to where it's a fetish that people pay me. So my clientele is real inclined to do that. Yeah. So it feels like that is a bit of a safer area of the industry Absolutely. because you have a lot more control over yeah. the relationship with mm-hmm. the people you have. But not everyone can get to that point. That's true. And that fetish is a specific taste. It's Whilst that can solve problems for individuals, it's not an industry-wide for solution. For sure. Yeah, my industry solution was I changed my business model to w- where I was in control all the time. Um, a lot of people can't do that. Right, okay. For sure. Okay, so if people wanted to learn more about this, like where would you recommend they go? What uh, Beyond obviously paying for content, is there any other action that can be taken? Is there anything else you would like to see happen? Um, I think just not being a dick. Okay. Not going on Twitter and getting in a fight with people. I mean, come on. Like it's, it's just crazy when if I put out a photo – People will come and content, you know, c- comment about your tits being out or you being a whore or whatever. Like, just don't like what? Who go? I don't know. I I block a lot of people on Twitter. Uh-huh. A lot, probably half of my followers. I vet every single person that follows me. I go to them to see if they're being an asshole because it's typically what it is. If you're a troll to one, you're gonna be a troll to a whole bunch. And um, so I block them. So I don't and I don't interact with trolls. So I don't get it a lot. But there's people that get hate all the fucking time. And if people weren't so awful to each other, th- this whole thing's going to be better. It's quite interesting that you're not censored on Twitter for sharing. I mean. Well, yeah. So we are because I have to mark my stuff 18 plus. So a lot of people won't even see my stuff. Okay, Which is fine. Yeah, but sure. It's very, right. inter- it's very easy to register an 18 plus account. Um, I obviously did my research last night. I Googled you. I've seen your work. Uh, I've seen your Twitter. I've. I've seen you naked, you know, and I've seen that on Twitter. Okay. Now, you are not being censored by Twitter for uploading naked photos, which ultimately will lead to more traffic for Twitter. But you are being censored by Cash App for receiving payments. So it feels like there's a certain amount of hypocrisy there. And actually, strangely, the payments just sit in the background. Nobody really knows about that. If anything, I don't agree with it, but I would understand... I could see their thought process for censoring the content because, you know, my son can have a Twitter account. Yeah, and I don't want, I mean, to be very clear, I don't want people under 18 seeing my content. First of all, they can't pay me, so fuck them. I don't want them to see me. Second of all, it's just fucking weird. I don't know. You, I've got a 15, <laughs> I've got a, well, he's nearly 15 now. They're, they have money these days. They have, they have cars, they have a way of, hey, they have crypto. Crypto can't stop them. Really? He didn't have to, like, KYC onto a exchange that he was of age? Um, not, I guess, if... My son doesn't have crypto, by the way, but <laughs> if I if I turn around to my son and went, you know, here's a wallet, here's some Bitcoin, uh-huh. I guess we have a problem there that I've just thought of right now, not really thought through. Uh-huh. Okay, that's a that's a slightly different thing. It, that's problematic. But that then comes down to my job as a parent, I guess. That's I guess. Slightly different. Okay, so uh, this has been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I think it's really important to get this out there. I've got a feeling some of my audience might reject this or might yeah. be kind of like, why are you doing this? Mm-hmm. 
Um, but at the same time, I think it's an important issue. I'm really glad to talk to you about it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you've been candid. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for lunch. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to pay you in Bitcoin. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, also, thank you. Um, if people want to talk to you or ask mm-hmm. you about this, is there any way they can get in touch? Yeah, you can go to my website, AllieKnox.com, or you can follow me on Twitter, AllieEveKnox. Um, you can buy my content through any of my links. Okay, amazing. Yeah. Well, listen, good luck with everything you thank do. You. and. I think we'll probably end up doing this again in the future. Cool. All right, take care. (laughs) Thanks. Next up, I have the interview with Amin, talking about the issues faced by sex workers and how crypto can help solve these problems. But before that, I've got a message from my show sponsors. Last time, I'm going to mention this about BlockFi and their new announcement that they have launched crypto interest accounts and that there's been a whole load of debate around this online. As I've been saying for the last few interviews, the floor is open. I've been speaking with the CEO, Zach Prince. We've got this great relationship where we can have quite an open dialogue. And he said, look, open up the floor. If people have got questions to me, let's let's do it, Pete. So if you've got questions about the interest accounts that BlockFi are running and you want them answered by Zach, feel free to email me. Every question sent to me will be put to him. We'll get on a mic next week and record it and stick it out on SoundCloud. You know my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Reach out to me there, send me all your questions, and yeah, we'll record this next week. And also, a last shout out to my new sponsor, Flubit. Not sure if you checked them out yet, you really should. I've actually used them a couple of times now since they've become a sponsor, just because of mainly this feature where you can compare with Amazon. You can go onto their website, you can do a search, and you can click show me items cheaper than Amazon, which is really cool and really useful. And also, they accept crypto, which is really useful. I mean, I paid with Bitcoin, but I know they accept Ether, Litecoin, and Mew. I don't know anything about Mew. It's not something I've ever used, but I used Bitcoin, so that was super cool. I ended up buying five copies of Andreas's The Internet of Money, and they've been delivered. So I'm going to give those out as prizes at some point next week. Keep an eye on my Twitter if you're interested in that. Definitely go and check them out. As I mentioned, they're basically like Amazon. They've got so many different things you can buy, but loads of the items they've got listed are cheaper than Amazon, and you can pay with your crypto. I can't say much better than that. So definitely go and check them out at flubit.com, which is F-L-U-B-I-T.com. Good morning, Amin. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So I was up early this morning watching the football, and I read a Decrypt article. And I've obviously been aware of you for some time, but it said you're in Venice, and I was in Venice. So I've messaged you. Match made in heaven. Yeah. Well, so normally I prepare about a day for an interview, and I've done about 30 minutes. So mm-hmm. we're just going to have to roll with this. There'll be a bunch of things I don't know. So you're just going to have to bear with me. It's cool. You caught me right when I was waking up. So Perfect. Cheers. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So can you give me the background, the uh, story from how you went from, you know, got to consensus, but then ended up doing Spank Chain? Yeah. Uh, so I was living on the balcony of a rationalist house in Berkeley. Uh, paying way too much um, and it was cold and sometimes it would rain on you um, but I had like a sleeping bag it was it was kind of nice uh, but then from there I, I learned about Ethereum and I read this blog post meditations on Moloch and I thought Ethereum could be interesting for helping humans solve coordination problems in general so I shipped off to consensus um, worked for Joe Lubin I worked mostly on like micropayment infrastructure state channels I was working sort of on the energy project there, uh, it was called Cotricity at the time. Um, and then at, towards the end of my working there, I moved on to out to LA to work on AdChain, which was the first uh, TCR, token curated registry. Uh, and then I left Consensus and I started asking myself, you know, where is adoption gonna happen first? Where is, you know, what's a good use case for these micropayment infrastructure that I've been working on? And I started looking at the adult entertainment industry uh, and porn. And so we built uh, the chem site. Um, we launched Spank Chain, uh, did a token sale in November of 2017, raised about six and a half million dollars, hired an elite team, and we shipped uh, the first payment channels on Ethereum. It's like Lightning. Um, but that was back in April, and we've made a number of upgrades since then, working with uh, Connext, uh, one of our partners. Uh, and others, um, and are in, in integrating the payment channels into a myriad of spank chain products. Right, and it's always porn that leads tech, right? That's what they say. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. What, why do you think that is? <laughs> well, for one, they'll try anything. Uh, <laughs> they're highly experimental. Uh, and two, cryptocurrency is this sort of 
fringe culture and adult is sort of also this fringe culture. And so it's a lot easier for the two to see eye to eye. Uh, and the third is that in this particular case, the thing that cryptocurrency offers uh, is you know, a way to store and transact, uh, store money and transact without being censored and having your funds seized. And that's exactly what that industry needs uh, because the adult industry in particular is uh, discriminated against at the hands of the financial institutions. They have their PayPal accounts shut down. Stripe won't process their payments. The bank close out their accounts. Stuff like that happens all the time. So just regular financial censorship. Yeah. And so for the adult entertainment industry, there's a much larger impetus to move on to this new financial system, right? So like one of my theses was you know, the, the people who are the most motivated to move to the new financial system are the ones most ostracized by the existing one. Right. And so, so is Spankchain a company that's building products or are you also building an infrastructure for the financial industry? Sorry, for the adult industry. It's both. Uh, we have apps and services. So like we have our own campsite, but we're also building a payment processor that merchants can integrate. Uh, so this campsite is called Spank, uh, spank.live. Uh, you can go to it. Uh, it's in beta. Um, the payment processor is not out yet, but that's what our primary focus is. And that's called Spank Pay. And so that you can think of that as like a PayPal for porn. And we'll be building SDKs for other um, services as we go. Like we can take the video component of, you know, Spank Live, put it into an SDK and allow anybody who is building their own application to use it. Right. Okay. So I read a quote by your head of outreach, Ali Evenox, and she said, you have these rich bankers closing performance accounts and then going home and jerking off to the women whose accounts they've just closed. I thought it was quite an interesting quote, right? Because I guess the adult industry is something which probably almost everybody uses in private and then publicly lots of people take a moral judgment against. Yeah. Uh, I, I stand by Ali's quote. I think it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, for and, and she's completely right. Uh, we're in this phase, I think it's personally a tipping point, where 70% of people watch porn, but we all act like nobody does it. 70% uh, of adults? 70% of adults. Right. Yes. <laughs> and that number has only been growing. And like the, the biggest resistance to the uh, widespread acknowledgement of the adult entertainment industry as a part of our lives comes from like the evangelical right. And the number of atheists is also going up uh, quite significantly <laughs> every year. And so you have this like beautiful, uh, set of conditions that in my mind will result in, in the next five to 10 years, like the stigma against the adult entertainment industry being eroded significantly. So is there still, or why do you think there is such a huge stigma around porn and what do you think would change it? I mean, there's always been a stigma against it in some sense. It's just that the reach of that stigma has uh, been, been pulled back over time. So like, let me give an example. Um, I was reading about early days of Playboy and Hugh Hefner, uh, you know, putting titties, bare breasts on a magazine was like a big deal in the 1950s, right? That was, that was like, ooh, this is weird, right? And, and the, uh, the, the post office refused to carry uh, his... Uh, magazines and refused to give him as much of a, 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 a comparable rate to everybody else who is distributing magazines. And he sued them and won. Uh, he won a million dollars in like today's uh, value of money. It was a hundred, hundred grand back then. Um, but that just goes to show that, you know, it's, it's sort of, you take the starting point of this and it's like, we, we haven't been distributing pornographic media. And then we, you start and you put titties on, you know, magazines and they're like, that's the beginning. And then now we're here. And so it's like every year that every generation pushes the boundary a little bit further. Right. But also at the same time, it can get pretty extreme on times online. Like, is there a limit to what people should see as socially acceptable? Um, I don't know that there's a limit that you'd ever want to die by. Right. Uh, because what we think is weird, the next generation might pick up and think is fine. Uh, and we should be prepared for our social fabric to evolve as our society does and as our technology moves us in that direction. All right. Well, let's, let's get into Spank Chain itself. Yeah. Okay. So what's the status of the project? How far have you got? 
um, we have a small team. Uh, we launched the campsite last summer. Uh, it's still in beta. We're building the payment processor, uh, talking to potential partners right now. We launched uh, the Spank Bank, um, which is our algorithmic central bank. You can stake your Spank and it mints booty, which is our stable coin. <laughs> <coughs> You you read that all, you said that all was such a straight phase. I've done this oh, quite a few times. <laughs> Spank bag where you mint booty coin. It's a stable coin, yeah, and, right? And booty is pegged, like you know, pegging like a booty, like you peg the butthole, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and so it's pegged to a dollar. Um, and then in the the next version, in the next like year to to eighteen months, I plan to introduce a booty call, uh, which is similar to a margin call, uh, but it will be for uh, you know keeping booty stable by using the spank stake as collateral right so tell me how the the sp- <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know man this is this I is can't a wait struggle. to explain this to congress yeah so <laughs> tell me how the spank bank works then because i tell you what there was another thing recently i said to somebody there is no sense in any uh dap or utility coin being anything but a stable coin yeah, I agree. And you've you figured that out now. Other yeah, we figured that out the hard way because we had you know tens of thousands of uh, payments on the campsite being processed and being the earnings were all in ether. And this was, you know, we launched with great fanfare at the midway through 2018, and everybody who held the ETH uh, at that point lost a bunch of money. And so we realized that you know this is a UX problem. We need to have people want to earn and spend in a medium of exchange that is. Uh, correlated with the, the you know the, the stuff that they regularly spend money on why do you think so many other apps and dapps and uh, tokens won't be a stable coin do you think it's just because they want the value of their token to grow and they're treating it like stock um no i mean most people just raised money with bad plans and right. they'll probably change those plans uh their plan was like they saw somebody raise money with a, a token model that was will earn and you know we'll have this two-sided network and the medium exchange will be our token and therefore it will be valuable which is stupid uh and many people pointed out it was stupid but the the wave of people pointing out it was stupid uh did not stop them from raising money uh so the feedback loop continued uh and grew and so you know until people actually try to use that in production and realize it's dumb they'll have to figure something else out right okay so i'm guessing the reason you didn't work and adopt a different stable coin is because none of them are really truly censorship resistant right you see the terms and conditions for the various stable coins that have been released and they all have something in there about the ability to block and censor payments yeah so we could use die and i would prefer die over anything else yeah um just because we have enough trouble with banks if you know it's easy for them to flip a switch and make our money worthless then i'm never going to hold it uh, whereas with Dai, it is legitimately decentralized, mm-hmm. and I know that I can go, you know, I can't go get Ether, but I can sell it to somebody, and, and if, you know, the under the value of the underlying collateral ever drops enough, then there will be a way for me to buy it with Dai and, and auction. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm like, we, you know, at some point held, Spank Chain held 1% of all the Dai. It's like something like $600,000 we cashed out when the markets were crashing. Um and so we, we could use DAI in our system as well. We haven't yet just because of like complexity of having to explain it to people like, what is this new other token? And so it's a little bit easier to be, you know, here's booty. This is like what we mint and operate. And it's basically used as our sort of internal accounting system. And also the, I think stable coins will get easier to build. Uh, like the whole maker model, like one of the things that they have is that they, hilariously and ingeniously name their variables totally you know nobody understands anything about their smart contracts because it's so hard to read sort of like da vinci uh you know encoding his scriptures and 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 whatever but uh eventually it'll get copied uh and i think that the cost of operating your own central bank like thing as a community will drop and we'll see you know thousands of these spring up that are uh, more on the spectrum of being like harder money. Um, Bitcoin is, you know, maybe the hardest money. Um, and then you have central banks that can arbitrarily change the rules as like the softer money. And then you might have something where like you have a, a, a central bank, but its operation is, you know, follows some rules that it encodes on a smart contract. And so you have 
a credible belief that it won't break them, you know, in certain ways. And that might be better. And it might also, if the benefits of that, the operation of that piece of financial infrastructure benefit the community that it's intended to serve, then I think that's better for all communities that wish to serve, you know, operate their own financial infrastructure for their own gain. Right. Okay. So how does the bank bank work and how are booty coins minted? Mm -hmm. Um, So we uh, have fees that we collect. Um, So we take like 5% on the campsite right now. So uh, we burn those fees and uh, the Spank Bank targets booty generation of 20 times the total amount in fees that were burned. So let's say we burn, we collect $20,000, you know, in, in, in fees. Well, 5% of that's one grand, right? So we burn $1,000 and the Spank Bank targets a total booty supply of 20 times that. So then there would be 20000 booty that should be in existence. And if let's say there was 20,000 booty, let's say we're at equilibrium and 1000 gets burned. Well, then now we're at 19. And so then 1000 will get regenerated and then distributed to all the spank stakers. Right. Okay. Okay. So you use the booty to, as the tip for the, uh, yeah. cam operate, uh, the cam models. Mm-hmm. Will we, we there... don't have to, like we could use something else. Of course. And then, I mean, you could use, uh, ETH or Bitcoin, we could right? use, well, we were using ETH, uh, happy to use Bitcoin. It's just hard. Like I'd have to build a whole nother wallet in the thing and like, okay, now you have two different types of keys that you have to, uh, think about. Um, <clears throat> but like, I'd love to see like a wrap ba- Bitcoin, uh, or something come to Ethereum and then make it really easy for me to integrate that with my existing wallet. There is a wrapped Bitcoin now. Uh, there is. I haven't. Um, I, I haven't integrated it yet, but I'm still looking into it. Um, I'm I'm a little uncertain about the federated models. There was interesting. Another quote I took out was from Molly Meows, mm-hmm. and she said, "Even accepting Bitcoin for her services, a popular choice among sex workers." required going through exchanges such as Coinbase themselves beholden to old school regulations. So actually the offboarding back to fiat is still difficult with Bitcoin. Uh, it's difficult with everything. Like Ether is no exception to that rule. Um, we, we discourage Coinbase uh, for performers uh, and, and users, uh, mostly for performers because Coinbase explicitly in their terms of service says you cannot use this for uh, you know, adult entertainment adjacent stuff. Uh, so we recommend Gemini and others. Right. Okay. I don't understand the adult industry that much at all. And it's definitely out here in the U S a bigger industry than where I am in the UK Mm -hmm. and uh, a little bit wilder, a little bit freer. So can you tell me some of the kind of myths about the adult industry that circulate? Uh, I'd say the biggest one is that they're dirty. Um, people think that, you know, because you're in porn, because you're having sex with somebody, you know, three times a week, maybe more for your job, maybe multiple people, uh, that you're unclean or, and and specifically, I mean, at a higher risk of sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, and I, I think that's completely untrue, uh, because everybody in porn who performs gets tested every two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's, all of the normies, as they say, right? We we have we call the no coiners normies uh, in this community. <laughs> but if you're an adult performer, you call you know the uh, <clears throat> less sexually gifted <laughs> normies. Um, and so, yeah, th- they're worried about catching things from normies who then don't protect and you know fuck around. So, are there any kind of risks for models going into the industry? Is there any? Can it be a gateway to you know potentially even prostitution or things like that? Yeah. I mean, personally, my view on prostitution is that it should be decriminalized. Uh, but I think yeah, I'm that, not saying that with any kind of judgment on prostitution, but sure. there are higher risks, I guess. Yeah. And in one case, you have um, performers who, you know, they're, they're used to they want to go like shoot a scene. They want it to boost their, you know, presence. And some agencies, you know, cut bad like bad deals where they either use financial pressure to get a performer to sign a contract uh that is disadvantageous for them or they uh you know encourage them to shoot scenes where it's like a dude with a camcorder in in a hotel and you know this guy doesn't have a page or you know it's, it's not legit um and if they were escorting they would be making three to five times as much money but because it's uh, seen as a shoot, uh, it's 
they make way less. And so it's unfair even from an economic standpoint, let alone the security risks. Um, thankfully, you have people like my one of my lawyers, uh, Al, uh, who just sued that guy uh, and won <laughs> uh, for you know representing a number of the performers that he was uh, abusing. Wow, okay. And so I checked out the website, the application to become a cam mm-hmm. girl. I guess I could have become a cam boy if I wanted. Yeah. But it's, so it's from 18 years of age. You're pretty inclusive. Yeah. yeah. I'm we'll not sure you. I'll try. I don't think anyone would pay I'll for tip me. you. No. You, t- <laughs> you know, I would tip you not to see me with my clothes I'll tip off. you with that money too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it's from 18 years of age, right? And, you know, it's obviously a, uh, a legal age of consent. Um, so I've got a, son who's just about turned 15 and he still seems very young so i still consider 18 pretty young are there any kind of protections you put in place or any processes you put in place for people who come on board any kind of things to help them deal with potential i don't know because it's quite it could be quite a scary industry to move into yeah and camming is like the safest possible version of that you could do it's like you're in your house like I mean, there there are some instances where, you know, camming is done in studios and in the worst case, it's like a mafia boss owns it or something, right? Uh, but in the happier case, it's like you with your laptop and your decorated, you know, room in your house and you stream for a bit and people cheer you on uh, and it's and it's fun. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm less concerned with that than like more hardcore stuff. Um, which can be a little bit more intimidating. You go into a room, there's, you know, five, eight people there uh, watching you have sex, right? And that's your job and you go and you perform and you do it for several hours. Um, On on the user side, uh, it's interesting that, you know, you bring this up, especially being from UK, because in the UK... Yeah, I know what you're going to (laughs) say. I know you know. Uh, Well, they, they had an ID card that you now have to like buy in a store in order to verify that you can, you are above 18 and you can watch porn. And these are the kinds of rules that get made when the old people still make the rules. But as they die <laughs> and the people who grew up with this stuff and aren't terrified by it, you know, treat this as normal, start making the rules. We're going to see the people look at that and be like, this is completely insane. Uh, <laughs> well, people, people don't want to be tagged and ID'd as, you know, as a right. porn user. Right, and especially, so it's not that you know, so much that porn is a gateway drug. It's actually, porn is the gateway for the governments of the world to stamp out your your, your freedom on the internet. Uh, because nobody will come and defend uh, their right to watch porn because, because it has the social stigma attached to it. So if you want to defend the internet, suddenly the, the government has put you in a position where they're like, oh, you want to, you want to defend uh, sex traffickers. That's what you want to do by keeping this site up. And it's really hard uh, to counter that narrative because it's really easy to just pile on against sex traffickers, even though it's a totally uninformed position. Uh, so, you know, we all basically, if we want to defend internet freedoms, we have to start, uh, you know, the, the adult industry for, for us, for people, you know, in Bitcoin who value uh, freedom, it should be the place where we start to uh, take a stance against uh, the government encroaching on our rights online. So do you as Spankchain have any campaigns that you're working on with this? Uh, we have made a number of uh, donations to uh, uh, people who were, you know, supporting sex workers uh, and, and combating FOSTA and SESTA. Um, I can't remember them all, but something, you know, $25,000, dollars range of donations that we've made. Um, we... We can't do as much as I wanted to do when, you know, we all had way more money last year. Uh, We have to be a little bit more focused on building a sustainable business. And I hope that as we continue, uh, I mean, one of the things we've done is within like the Ethereum community, we we've been embraced at first. Everybody thought we were weird. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, this is. I don't know, these spank chain guys, it's a porn thing, are we going to... But then I think our message came through, which was like, you know, this is actually a a group of people who really need what it is that our community is offering, and we shouldn't turn them away. Uh, And so I think that, you know, our community has seen that, and I I know that they value it a lot. Uh, And so I I hope that we can continue to bring these two communities together uh, in order to bring the benefits of crypto to performers and also uh, have performers and, and models and sex workers who 
could actually benefit from this, like, you know, bring adoption uh, to our industry. You did offer your bounties, didn't you? Your $25,000 bounties. And that was kind of interesting, but I didn't know. See, this is where I haven't had much time to prepare. I didn't know about this Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Can you right. tell me about it? Yeah, FOSTA. Uh, so it stands for Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, and that's basically what uh, Congress used. And this is like the only thing that everybody in Congress can agree on. It was like 97 to 2 in the Senate, right? It was like 500 plus to like one or three, I don't know, in the house. Uh, it's, 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 it's sort of crazy to think about that. Uh, so more or less, uh, what it, what it does is it removes, I, I forget what exact act it is, but it removes the, uh, liability protection for website operators, uh, for user generated content. So it normally, or, or how it was, was that you were not liable as a site operator for something that somebody posted on your site. Right. If you owned Reddit, you weren't liable, um, Craigslist and, and so forth. And what we see as a response to this, uh, this the, you know, was passed into law last year. What we've seen as a response is Reddit took down you know, their personal section. Craigslist took down their personal section. Um, Tumblr banned porn. Like, and, and no action has actually been taken. So like the founders of Backpage, which was the largest uh, online escorting uh, site in the U.S. were you know raided and imprisoned, uh, but th it wasn't actually anything to do with sex trafficking. It was like money laundering and and other things, right? But it it just you know they they use these things as as the um, scapegoat. So uh, the the e the, the what is it the e f EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, I think. Yeah, they're actually suing uh, over this. They're suing Congress. They're saying that this is unconstitutional. Uh, so if you would like to, you know, get involved, that's like a good way to support the EFF. And um, <laughs> maybe we should ICO the lawsuit. <laughs> okay, well, Make so, Congress pay damages. <laughs> so you're offering bounties of $25,000 for catching politicians caught yeah. sleeping with sex workers who supported... So we briefly uh, offered twenty five thousand dollar bounties for information from from sex workers who could provide you know evidence that uh, politicians who did vote yes on those bills were uh, using sex traffickers because I mean do the math course. right uh, like how many of them do you actually think have never you know slept with an escort like it it seems vanishingly low uh, and given that almost all of them like given that it was basically unanimous it means that the probability that somebody voted yes on it and also has done this is very high and this brings me back to ali's point right where it's like these guys are shutting down performers accounts and then you know going home and jacking off to them and it's like exactly the same with, with uh the wankers and it uh i have trouble using this pejoratively um because you know there's nothing wrong with being a wanker but uh these guys uh they they have you know, taking the position that this should, you know, uh, to, to discriminate even further, uh, using the adult industry uh, as, a, as a scapegoat, um, rallying everybody against sex trafficking that isn't going to be solved by this. It's actually going to get made worse because people are going to end up back on the streets where it's less safe uh, in, in order, you know, and, and then what? They're going to go home and still, like... Be a hypocrite. Be a hypocrite. Like, watch porn and, and like, sleep with sex workers and, like, th that's what they do. Did you pay any bounties out? Uh, we did not. Uh, we quickly uh, decided to um, stop doing that <laughs> <laughs> and then use the money more productively to d donate it towards uh, the advocacy organizations. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a bit more about Spank Chain and the, ca the campsite. And, yeah, um, maybe one day we'll go back to it <laughs> when we're a bit bigger. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about the benefits because there is a natural fit between crypto and what you're doing. So... There's no chargebacks. So how big a problem is chargebacks for adult performers? Uh, it's a pretty big problem. I mean, it's, it's classified as high risk and all the payment processors that serve them charge, you know, 10 or so percent, which is like three times uh, as much. Um, t 10 is like a decent rate. Um, it goes up to 15. Um, but, but that's just for, you know, stuff that everybody else takes for granted. Uh, everybody else expects, you know, 3% as, as sort of the payment processing rate. Um, but because there's more chargebacks uh, in an adult, somebody steals a credit card, goes on it, or it's you know somebody's 
uh, their wife finds out and they say, it wasn't me, it was stolen. <laughs> right. Uh, that's what the adult industry has to deal with. And because the double spend window uh, of the legacy financial system is like 30 to 90 days and not like 10 minutes like in Bitcoin, then you have this possibility. Uh, being able to use something like payment channels or even just accepting crypto means that uh that those kinds of chargebacks are impossible and that the transaction fees can be way lower because you don't need a fraud department. Right, okay. And I think tied with that, you've also got anonymity for customers because one of the things about paying for porn is that, you you know, if you are using a credit card, you have to create an account, mm -hmm. you've got your details. And I, the, you, I guess there's also the risk of the hacks. I can't remember, there was the dating site, Madison... Ashley hacked, Madison. Ashley Madison that got hacked. Yeah, that's right. And everybody who was a user was publicly outed on a website as being right. the user of a cheating website. So I guess that's a, an, the an anonymity which comes for customers is another great benefit. Yeah, so if you want today, you sign up for your Spank Live account, you don't actually need to use an email address or password. You can use a key as your authentication mechanism. Uh, and you know we're gonna add the username and password option because there's many people who are, you know they just want to, to, to watch, they don't care as much. Uh, but if you do, then uh, I don't think there's a whole lot that beats being able to sign in with a key, not needing a username uh, attached to it, not needing your bank attached to it. Because as long as you know you put the money in the account, it came from somewhere, it could come from an exchange, a Tumblr, <laughs> um, you can pay with Zcash. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty good. And then in terms of the adult entertainers, you only take 5% of fees. I saw on your website that they can be charged up to 50%. Yeah, most campsites charge 50% wow. right now. Uh, we charge cut. a lot less. Does that mean you're getting quite a lot of adoption? Uh, it means that we're well positioned for growth, but uh, it also means, you know, for us, like the big problem after we solved, you know, instant payments with uh, the payment channels and adding the stable coin to, to get that, the, our, still our biggest problem is uh, KYC, right? Like 99% of the people who come don't have crypto already because that's the state of the world that we live in. So we're leaving a lot of money on the table by uh, you know, excluding them. Because for them, the story is, I show up, okay, I want this. Um, you know, this is a, a good way to support the performers that I want. You know, they're gonna get way more of it than if I was gonna tip them on some other site. Uh, but now I, I can't because I don't have crypto. Okay, so I go to Coinbase, I have to upload an ID, I have to connect my bank. Okay, no, uh, I don't really feel like doing this, thank you. Um, now maybe for them the the better alternative is invite them in have them learn over time and then you know pass savings on to them like if you can save 10 percent by coming in if you don't uh use a credit card and then after a while they've gotten more used to it they see people talking about it um that's the sort of gateway i see so can somebody signing up use their credit card on your site to buy booty coins soon soon okay so you've almost got an exchange option for them right yeah but aren't you going to have your then own KYC demands? Um, so there's ways around it. Uh, the, the way we're going to use is basically when you buy with credit card, it'll be as if you're buying into a normal campsite. You're not getting the ERC-20 booty. You're getting like some database entry. Uh, and then it's on us to actually abstract all of this away at the UI level. So whether you're buying in with you know credit card and getting database booty, D-booty, as I like to call it, uh, right. or if you're buying in with crypto and getting a real ERC-20 token, then uh, it looks the same. You and, know, I, and I guess the same. I guess sometimes centralized components like that aren't bad, right? I mean, like look at Coinbase, right? Like what is Coinbase? It's a bunch of wallets and a UI. And like what they've done, the hard parts of what they've done is security and paperwork. Uh, everything else is... <laughs> you know, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Well, Brian Armstrong admitted that himself. And I can't remember the quote, but he talked about that the, a lot of the business that will be built will be centralized companies built upon decentralized technology. Yeah. So that I guess you, so, there's only certain aspects that you need for decentralization, which is for censorship resistant money, that right. component. Yeah. What's the offboarding process for uh, entertainers to receive their money? Yeah, so they get it in the wallet in Booty, and then they click a button, and it sends them Ether equivalent. Um, we have ETH and Booty reserves on chain on our payment channel contract, uh, so it makes administrating it a little bit easier uh, because we can do an on-chain exchange as part of a withdrawal. Okay, so they still uh, have to use an exchange, I tell. <coughs> well, it's it's like a 
you know, they're getting it in a channel, and so then they just cash out of the channel in Ether. Right. Um, so uh, that, yeah, and, and like some of them might even trust us and be like, you know, it's fine if you just hold on to this, you know, credit for me, this booty. Uh, it's essentially them giving us a short-term loan, right? Um, and then like at the time that they want, then they click the button, they get Ether, and what they do is they go to an exchange, we recommend Gemini, and then they cash out to their bank or spend it. Why is it you recommend it. Gemini? Just, it's, you know, one of the more well-known ones that is not Coinbase. Like for, <laughs> for all of Gemini's, like, we need regulations and, and yeah, yeah. sort of silly That's what I was uh, thinking. signaling, That's... right? It's like, well, they don't have it explicitly against their terms of conditions to, uh, you know, affiliate with the adult industry. So you so. really don't like Coinbase? I, I love Coinbase. I think it's right. great. Uh, I can't recommend it for <laughs> yeah. any of anybody in the adult entertainment industry. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, I don't know, the hacking team stuff w was unfortunate, but I think they did the right response, stuff like that. Right. right. Okay. So you also, as an entertainer, you can't have your account closed. Uh, you, you can have your account closed. You we can. have, we follow laws, right? We okay. have, Con terms and conditions uh we are uh, about as lax as it gets uh in terms of um like most of the rules on like content come from uh payment processors like they don't want to process payments for things like uh blood uh like if you're on your period you can't uh really perform um because those that content cannot be displayed anywhere even if there's people who are into it um which many are um urine and feces are, are also there and uh it's not something i'm personally interested in but i can understand that there are people who are and and the rules against that are, are from payment processors so like you know if you come in with crypto uh you can get all of that without any sort of rules we're, we're not going to block you for for dem you know showing that content um but at the same time, you know, if if you make an account and somebody underage comes on uh, and streams, and it's you're pretending that that's you, that's uh, something that we have to take quite seriously, uh, and we'll have to shut down the account. Right? So, so you have to take. There's a lot of responsibility that you have to take seriously what you're doing because you are trying to build a business. Right. We are trying to build a business. We operate compliantly in all the states in which we operate. Have you had any kind of legal pressure at all um not yet we've been pretty careful okay. um in terms of the uh, structure of the company it mm -hmm. seems to be that you're run by people who understand the industry uh i'd say we understand or you know we're trying to learn more every day okay so what are, what are your biggest challenges you're facing mm, i think the the biggest challenges will be just unifying our sort of two accounting systems uh it's going to take work and then you know having a, a a nice interface on top um and then bringing so that's that's internally that's like for our own products first uh and then externally it's uh convincing merchants in the crypto winter that they will see you know more payments and save money on the crypto payments uh that they get and that they should integrate with our payment system how much did the bear market affect you guys um, I think, I think it, it affects us in terms of sentiment, uh, and excitement, uh, for example, building, you know, really technologically advanced systems, uh, to help with marketing to the Ethereum community was like great when Ether was at a thousand dollars, uh, it was a much more viable strategy than it is now. Um, so how it has affected us is, you know, needing to focus more on beautiful fiat dollars. Uh, because those, you know, at least they still have them, uh, and then, uh, making it work with the, the stuff we have. Um, so I've got a couple of questions to finish out on. Okay. You won an award at the adult video awards, right? Avian best app. Uh, that's actually incorrect. Is it incorrect? But it's in the articles. I know. <laughs> uh, so we, we were nominated for a number of awards at AVN. Yeah. We didn't win any, oh. but we did win DAP of the year at DevCon. <laughs> So the part of that article that is cor is correct is that we did win the award. It okay. just wasn't at AVN. So did you go to did you go to AVN? <laughs> yeah, we went to AVN this year and last year. What's it like? It's a lot of fun. It's uh, what you might expect when 
you know, basically all of the porn stars on earth get together and uh, have a party. All right. So the last thing I want to ask you about is the tech. So mm -hmm. you're doing some quite innovative stuff with state channels, right? Yeah. It's way over my head. Can you just talk me through it? Uh, well, it's kind of like the lightning network, but if, you know, the lightning network is a fast calculator built on a slow calculator, uh, state channels are fast computers built on a slow computer. Uh, so the thing about state channels is like you can do anything on it that you could do on a smart contract, uh, you know, as, as you could do on Ethereum, um, not just payments, but payments are a really great use case. And so the way to build payments on state channels is to implement the logic of a state channel where the state is the balances of the two parties and the state transition is that one can pay the other. All right. Um, so we, we did that. We've done that a couple times. Um, so we built the first payment channel system in April that was like unidirectional ether only. Uh, and then we upgraded it. And so now we have like a non-custodial, uh, payment system. So you open up a bi-directional channel with a hub. Uh, and so you and the hub both can have money in it. You can both send money back and forth. So that means you can send in the channel. You can also receive in the channel. Uh, and then you can open up threads, uh, which or you, you know, some people call them virtual channels, which are unidirectional uh, and can be opened directly with a counterparty that also has a connection to that hub. Uh, so if you don't have a connection with somebody, it's fine. You can still pay them through the system. Are you building this yourself or are you building on we top of We already built this. Uh, so we built this in collaboration with Connext, okay. uh, who's now marketing the technology to the rest of the Ethereum ecosystem when we took an equity position in Connext um, as, as part of the deal. And... Uh, yeah, and now we're, we're still collaborating with the counterfactual guys. They're a little bit behind, uh, in terms of their client implementation, but the idea is to take our use case to drive their development of the more abstract, more general purpose version of this, because ultimately, you know, we should be able to use the same smart contract base because they're building, uh, very, very generalized state channels, which means they it should be able to do anything. Our, our use case included. Much, much of a headache in it in place. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, I think building for like a specific UCS makes a lot of sense. Like you wouldn't have wanted to build Ethereum before you built Bitcoin. That would have made no sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, but building Bitcoin helps you understand like, well, let's rewind a bit. Uh, Ethereum was invented by Vitalik when he went around to all the people who were trying to build colored coins and, and whatnot and wanted some specific change in Bitcoin, but needed to fork the protocol in order to add that opcode in or whatever. And then he realized, oh, what if we made a thing that could, you know, ha had a generalized system of opcodes that could process anything? And that's what inspired Ethereum to be built. So I think state channels, you could see the same contract core being used for anything from games to gambling to payments um, to, I don't know, data storage even. I'm like uh, correlating those two, um, like... You know, you want you promise that you'll lock up some or you know store some data for me, and then I give you a micropayment every month, so long as you can prove you still have it. All right. So what what do you got coming up? What should we keep an eye out from Spank Chain? Um, yeah, keep an eye out for merchant adoption. Spank Chain growing up, becoming a real business, uh, getting partnerships, making deals. Uh, keep an eye out for the Cam site dropping uh, its beta, uh, expanding internationally. Um, adding private shows and adding fiat payments and keep an eye out for a clip site that we have on the way after that so that you can upload videos and sell them uh, for crypto. All right, cool, man. Okay, so how do people stay in touch? Who do you want to hear from? Yeah, sure. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Amin Soul. Um, we're at SpankChain also. Um, join our Discord. We have a vibrant community of performers and crypto enthusiasts that are all teaching each other uh, about our communities. Brilliant. Look, thanks for doing this. This is such short notice. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Okay, so how was that? What did you make of those two interviews? As I said, I'm not promoting Spank Chain, and I expect people will say I'm trying to legitimize a business. I'm going to stay neutral on this. I don't know fully whether or not they will be able to create a legal, viable, and ethical long term business, but I do believe Amin has honest intentions of helping sex workers. 
And yeah, I'm happy to discuss this, so feel free to reach out to me. I really think some of the issues here faced by sex workers need considering. I personally can't understand the deplatforming and financial censorship here. For people working in a legal industry, by financially censoring them or making things difficult, I think the only impact is on the sex workers themselves and is only negative. It was really interesting to learn about how little regulation there is in the industry and the potential for exploitation and abuse of adult entertainers. I don't think it's healthy with this industry to have so much stigma and for people not to talk about it as such a high percentage of the population do consume pornography. It is a reality. It is there. If we contribute towards this industry, I think we have a responsibility to the workers to protect them. Like in any other industry, I don't see any kind of tiered protection systems in place here. Everyone is the same. They are working in a legal industry and these people deserve protection. So that's my view. You might disagree. If you do, feel free to reach out to me and tell me. I personally enjoy doing the interviews. I definitely want to look into this more and we'll be covering this again in the future. Also, thank you to everyone who supports the show. I'm not going to do my regular blah, blah, blah. Look, if you want to support the show, just head over to my website. It's whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. There's a whole bunch of stuff there that will tell you what you can do. And as I said in the intro, Lightning Week starts next week whole bunch of interviews starting to come out about that so that's exciting you know if you want to speak to me my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com and i look forward to hearing from you 